Hello again. Uh, here is my lecture, which is a follow-up to uh, our last conversation about the Cold War, okay, the time uh, of history, period of history that lasted from 1946 to 1989 to the fall of the Berlin Wall. And at the very end of this, um, and the very end of this period, <clears throat> Cold War, we witnessed the collapse of communism, okay? And um, I did not expand too much last time on the collapse of communism, so how it ended, what happened, and uh, essentially how <clears throat> in this confrontation between the Soviet Union, which was a communist country, and uh, the Western countries headed by headed by the United States, how it ended. So today we are going to discuss this topic, and um, let's get going. Remember, last time I mentioned that the whole Europe during the Cold War became divided in two uh, parts. The Soviet-dominated part, which included the Eastern European satellites of the Soviet Union, so socialist or communist satellites, and um, Western Europe, these countries which are colored in blue, that the members of NATO, uh, along with the Canada and the United States, they represented the military alliance that confronted the so-called the Warsaw Pact. Warsaw Pact, it's uh, countries that were uh, united by the Soviet Union into one big communist military alliance. And the whole Europe was divided by so-called Iron Curtain. Remember this expression that had been introduced by Winston Churchill in 1946. And indeed, uh, literally, uh, Western and Eastern Europe were divided by, by the barbed wire. Uh, two systems uh, confronted each other. And the division of the city of Berlin in two parts, West Berlin and East Berlin, symbolized this division into the world, the house of communism and uh, the house of capitalism, so to speak. <clears throat> but after the death of Stalin, in 1953, we see that the relaxation of tension between the West and the East, when two uh, parts of the world decided to gradually enter negotiations, trade relationships, cultural exchange, and that was so-called Thor, Nikita Khrushchev Thor, when the Soviet leader who took over after Stalin died in his secret speech, he denounced his predecessor as the criminal who smeared the clean uh, image of communism. So Khrushchev had this desire to uh, polish the image of communism to make it more attractive. But in his criticism of Stalin, he went too far and he um, antagonized the secret police, antagonized the communist bureaucrats who controlled the Soviet Union, uh, this bureaucracy. Uh, that control the Soviet Union didn't like him. They wanted to, they didn't want to extend the Stalinization too far. So in 1964, they kicked him out and uh, a new leader took over, which decided to consolidate the power of the communist bureaucracy without changing anything. So no more brutal uh, t killing of bureaucrats because essentially Stalin's dictatorship uh, targeted on a random basis those people who potentially might threaten the regime. So that is why uh, under so-called the Great Terror in 1930s, under Stalin, uh, the communist bureaucracy was purged. It had been purged in 1930s and was replaced by the loyal bureaucracy that uh, personally owed their positions to Stalin and his cronies. So now Khrushchev came to power and he uh, eliminated this, uh, I would say, the terrorist element in communism and softened the image of communism. But in his criticism, he wanted to go too far. And that is why communist bureaucrats who were happy that 
they were not killed anymore by such a brutal monster as Stalin, still were afraid that if Khrushchev uh, would go too far in his criticism, he might throw the, ba the communist baby with the bathwater. So that is why the communist bureaucracy took over, kicked him out, and decided to freeze everything as it was. So that's, that, that is why we have this so-called stagnation period. It's a period of history in the world of communism when they didn't do any changes, when the communist system gradually, slowly, but gradually decided, uh, deteriorated. So economic inefficiency of socialist system revealed its nature during this time. In the communist bloc in Eastern Europe, originally, remember, China was also the member of the communist bloc, but then they split and we will be talking about it. But all over the communist world, both in China and Soviet Union and her satellites, we have uh, from 1950s to 1980s a deteriorating economy when the government, centralized government, controlled everything. No room for private enterprise, no room for private property. In fact, private property was made illegal. So if you wanted to sell something and buy something on a regular basis, you could be thrown into prison because private enterprise was uh, something that contradicted the uh, socialist ideology of the Soviet communist regime and the Chinese communist regime and the other communist regimes. There were many, many countries that claim to build socialism and um, in 80 percent of these countries private property was outlawed everything was controlled by the government and economy was um, ruled was decreed by the centralized planning so everything was centralized central uh, planned from the center so how many boots you produce how many pencils uh, how many copy uh, blue books how many shoes, how many coats, everything was planned. So needs of consumers were neglected. The government issued quota <laughs> for each factory, how much they had to produce. And that was it. Okay. The biggest, the major stress was on uh, heavy and military industry. Okay. A neglect of consumer goods. So such consumer uh, goods like uh, toothpaste, toilet paper uh, were, was neglected. This uh, merchandise was totally neglected. It was produced on a limited scale and the people constantly experienced uh, food shortages or shortages uh, of common items like toilet paper. Okay. So we have stagnation in the communist bloc. Communist command economy was um, breaking down and there was no incentives to work hard because uh, people were forbidden to make more money, so you were paid as much as your neighbors, as much as your colleagues, so there was no um, difference, okay? If you belong to a particular grade of engineers, a particular grade of uh, um, workers, so you no, no matter how much you produce, how much you work, so you couldn't, you couldn't be paid, okay? That was upset people. So that is why um, in the communist world, in all communist countries, from China and Soviet Union to Eastern Europe, they developed so-called uh, black market when people illegally were selling and buying things which were not available in state stores because in the government stores, there were only few items. There were like 10, 15 food items that were heavily subsidized by the state. It's like a form of welfare. And um, the rest of the stuff was not available. You couldn't buy a car. You had to wait in line for 10, 15 years. You couldn't buy an apartment. You couldn't buy uh, a summer cottage. Okay. You couldn't buy a fridge. So again, you have to wait in line to buy a fridge. So that is why those people who needed it had to urgently needed they had to go to the black market to buy these things okay so but to make a long story short there was governments did not create in communist countries did not give people incentives to work hard and that was the bad thing okay because everything was controlled by the government and essentially entire society 
in each communist country was on welfare, the greater part of society, um, except that communist bureaucracy. Although communist bureaucracy was also enjoyed a form of welfare because, but it was a high form of welfare. If you belong to a communist bureaucracy, you were entitled to a private car, you were entitled to a special stores, you were entitled to foreign trips, you were entitled to special schools, your kids, you were entitled to a good vacations. So um, there was a particular uh, form of like a high entitlement for communist bureaucracy. But for lower pop populace, for the rest of society, 90% of the populace, it was just general welfare, like 14 basic food subsidized by the government, um, a shabby, a small studio type apartments, again, uh, subsidized by the government, uh, poorly equipped uh, hospitals, uh, government a health system, also subsidized by the government. It was free formally, but you had to wait in line for surgery or you had to pay a bribe because when everything is for free, nothing is for free because everybody wants it. So that is why people begin to pay bribes, people, people begin to wait in lines. So we have a lot of abuse, corruption, okay? Um, in communist countries, uh, especially in those countries which were located close to the Western European countries, where they could listen to foreign radio, where they could watch Western TV, uh, people were attracted to the Western style of life, which they didn't have in their own countries. Okay, So in this ca case, communist dictatorships tried to close their countries as much as possible because they were afraid that if more people would be exposed to the Western style of life, so it means the image of the socialist state where supposed everybody uh, lives in paradise would be ruined, would be damaged. That is why they were trying to hide how people in the West live. They tried to show that in the West, everybody was poor, everybody, crime was high, <clears throat> and everybody uh, <clears throat> is neglected and is capitalist. It's only what 1% of people live. They didn't tell people that all Americans had cars, that even poor people who were on welfare in the States <laughs> had air conditioning. In Soviet Union, there was no air conditioning. In China, there was no air conditioning. Okay. So uh, not uh, hardly anybody had a refrigerator. Only in the 1980s, people started getting refrigerators. Again, whatever the people in the West who lived on welfare in 1970s had, it was... Uh, like a middle class level of life for communist countries like who lived in Soviet Union in China okay and on top of this the communist leadership in each communist country was old unable to change and it was equally true for China Soviet Union for Romania for Poland there were no elections no free press no political freedoms so it was just George Orwell in 1984 if you read this book this totalitarian, um, slightly changed totalitarian dictatorships, okay, where, where everything was controlled by the government, okay. So standards of life in the communist bloc were far behind uh, the West, but at the same time, um, society was, I repeat, equal in equal, people were equal in misery. So everybody was relatively poor. There was no uh, reason for people to be envious because the communist bureaucracy, which did have higher living standards, which did have a lot of perks, they lived behind the walls. Nobody could see how they lived. And on average, people had the um, equity. So there was a certain um, form of equity where if you could make more money than your neighbor, so you were not jealous, everybody was poor. Everybody was on welfare, entire society. Um, basic foods were subsidized, um, uh, formally health care was available for everybody. And again, I have to say that basic health care was okay. You know, if you broke your leg, it could be fixed. If you had the flu, you could get some kind of medicine. But what if you need a surgery? In this case, yes, you had to die because there were not much help for you. You either had to wait in line for six months for a kidney or... Uh, it was not available. Okay, if you needed some kind of sophisticated dentistry, if you needed a heart surgery, 
if you needed um, uh, something to to work on your stomach so it was uh, it was horrible so it was not available again you had to pay extra money to surgeon uh, to start um, uh, to people who performed surgery without this they couldn't do it because it was really expensive so it was not for everybody <clears throat> Well, education was also for free, but again, uh, the competition in, uh, for these openings in colleges was so high that people had to pay bribes or um, highly positioned people who were communist bureaucrats. Uh, they made phone calls. They tried to use their networks in order to put the children in colleges, which left a lot of people neglected. There was a lot of affirmative action for specially designated groups of people, like, for instance, for those people who were industrial workers, since in communist countries, proletariat, industrial, working class, they were considered the salt of the earth. This is the backbone of society. So they were to enjoy privileges. So if you were a worker, proletarian, you could be admitted in a college for with a special quota. So if you served in the army, also you could enjoy a certain quota. So there was, a, there was a bunch of quotes, so there was hardly any room for free competition, you know, knowledge competition, when you could offer your talents, your merit, your skills, and you could not be assessed on the basis of your merit. So there was a bunch of quotes, a bunch of uh, perks, a bunch of corruption. So it was very hard to get into college if you were simply a talented guy who did not belong to any um, specially privileged group, you know, because, uh, again, affirmative action uh, penetrated this um, the Soviet system with different types of quotas. Um, as I said, I showed you this map last time, and I said that um, after the Second World War, Communist China and Soviet Russia, they actually served as a magnet to many new a newly liberated colonial countries in the third world. Why? Because they uh, confronted Western countries, China and uh, Soviet Russia. Okay, but um, many Asian, African, and Latin American countries they were either colonies or Western countries like France and England, or they were like semi-colonies. They depended on Britain, France, or in case of Latin America, on the United States. So there was a lot of animosity toward the, Western, toward the Western countries on the part of the third world countries. So that is why when they liberated themselves, many of these countries embraced uh, either uh, socialism or communism. Again, socialism, a served version of communism or communism as a militant version of socialism. So on this map, again, you see these countries uh, which are colored in red, uh, brown, okay, which... Um, fall of the, so the socialist path, okay, socialist path. In um, countries which are colored in uh, brown, they declared democratic socialism, India, Burma, Tanzania, Madagascar. Okay. At one point, Iraq also said they were building democratic socialism, which is bizarre, it was dictatorship. So there, there are many other countries adopted Chinese or Soviet model, it's like Stalinism, uh, following this militant, radical, uh, form of socialism, or in other words, communism. So it was a very attractive before communism showed that it was economically um, impossible. Okay, it ruins the entire economy before it happened uh, in the 1980s when people in the third world realized that there was a dead end. There was a lot of fascination with this um, socialism. Okay, we have to stress this, and unfortunately, textbooks do not tell us about this. All right. So, um, we have a bunch of dictatorships uh, in the third world which adopted this uh, the socialist path, like in Cuba, Fidel Castro dictatorship, 1959. In fact, Fidel Castro in Cuba, who came to power, and he was not a Marxist originally, but he needed the, the Soviet Union as his ally, and he said, hey, I'm a communist, so he purposely declared himself a communist to make friends with the Soviet Union, okay, which tells us about something else, that during the Cold War, some of the Third World countries, they actually played the U.S. and the USSR, the Soviet Union, against each other, trying to get benefits from both, some of them, like Yugoslavia, it's a communist country, Yugoslavia in Europe, 
which originally quarreled with the Soviet Union when the communist dictator of Yugoslavia um, broke away from Stalin in 1948. It, it, he quarreled with Stalin. So in later he turned to the United States, but when Stalin died, he again turned back to the Soviet Union. In the meantime, he received the financial help from both, both from the Soviet Union and from the United States. There was also Cambodia. It's a deadly communism, killing communism. When uh, in Cambodia, a brutal communist imitated um, China, Stalinism, kind of, uh, kind of 200 degrees Stalinism. Ethiopia, Soviet style militant communism, India, democratic uh, socialism. I, I guess here in India, uh, they were um, benign because uh, the, the benevolent presence of the British law and order, the British constitutional system did work well and they were not susceptible to this uh, dictatorial um, communism like in China and Russia. So they were more prone to democracy, parliamentary system, hence but still they adopted at some point the democratic socialism in 1960s, 1970s, 1980s, and they called it, but it was democratic socialism, a kind of vegit, quote unquote, soft vegetarian version of socialism. In Tanzania, another English colony, by the way, they also built a soft, like a benign version of socialism. It was called Ujama or African cooperative socialism. It wasn't as brutal as Chinese or Soviet communism. In Egypt, they were building Arab socialism, but there it was brutal, of course, because um, it was a Muslim country with a lot of brutality inherited from Ottoman Turks. Remember Seljuk Turks? Uh, that was an authoritarian empire, so it was an authoritarian country here. But still they claimed also socialism. See how popular it was at some point. Nicaragua, here they copied Cuban style communism, many, many other countries you can name. The, the biggest, um, the major country that followed the communist path was China, of course. After 1945, Chinese communists became very popular in China because they had something to offer to the Chinese peasants. They said that we're going to give you land, and indeed they, they uh, did this in 1949. When communists in China came to power, they, di they did give land to the people. Of course, uh, they didn't tell the peasants that uh, they would take away this land, and they did. Uh, ten years later, they uh, collectivized, like in Soviet Russia. They collectivized the entire land domain in China, took away land from peasants, and forced Chinese peasants to live on, in communes. So, Chinese peasants, who originally had welcomed communists now, uh, in 1950s, lost all their rights and uh, had to live under socialism. So the same thing happened uh, had happened in Soviet Union with the Russian peasants, the Ukrainian peasants. Okay, but uh, China was the biggest communist country, the biggest communist country. Okay, Soviet Union again, uh, which was used by the Chinese communists as a model in terms of population, was smaller than China. Soviet Union had only like 200 million people, but China was uh, almost a billion people. So it was the largest communist country. That is why, remember last time we mentioned that uh, within the United States, there was a fear in 1949 that communism was expanding all over the world and soon they might take over Western Europe, the United States, and hence this military alliance uh, established by the United States in 1949, called the NATO, remember NATO in 1949. Uh, the dictator of uh, China was Mao, his uh, complete name is Mao Zedong. He was the dictator, he was Chinese Stalin, who ruled the country from 1949 to 1976. Okay, He actually, he wanted to outdo Stalin. Stalin for Mao was the role model. But in his activities, he wanted to outdo Stalin. He wanted to show that China could build communism quicker than in Soviet Union. So that is why he declared this um, deadly project called the Great Leap Forward from 1958 to 1961. The essence of the project was, as I said before, to force Chinese peasants onto communes. Okay. Remember I told you when we discussed the Soviet Union that Soviet peasants had been forced 
to live in collective farms. But at least, in the, and of course, it was deadly, and we said that millions of Russian peasants w um, were starved to death because Stalin had confiscated the seed grain from the Russian and Ukrainian peasants. Okay, But uh, even Stalin uh, did not... Um, force peasants to eat together, to sleep together, to wear the same clothing. In fact, in um, communist Russia, Stalin had to allow uh, peasants in, on collective farms to have small backyard gardens, personal gardens, where they could grow produce. Here in China, during this uh, great leap forward, Mao forbade peasants to have any backyard gardens. Okay, Peasants were forced not only to work together, Peasants were forced not only to deliver a mandatory quota of rice they had to provide each year. It was a deadly quota of rice they were obligated to deliver to the government. But they also had to wear the same clothing, blue robes, both men and women. They had to eat together. They had to sleep together in barracks. And their children had to be raised in daycare centers. Okay, It was like ultimate totalitarian utopia. That's what... Mao did, and he also confiscated, issued deadly quotas. He uh, collected um, millions of tons of rice, sometimes uh, confiscating uh, from peasants the seed rice, which had to be used for seeds, in order to have this rice to do what? To sell this rice abroad. For what purpose? Again, like in case of Stalin, China wanted to build a powerful military industry okay, in order to get money to uh, fund the military industry, they had to sell something and they had nothing except rice. So that's what they did. They confiscated the rice, sold it abroad and used this money to fund their industrialization, to build factories, military factories. Okay, But something happened between the Soviet Union and China, which split them apart. What was it? As I said, in 1953, Stalin died. Okay, who was revered by Mao, who, would, who was revered as the role model. And Khrushchev, who took over, started to criticize Stalin. And particularly, Khrushchev criticized Stalin for the Great Terror. He criticized him for Gulag. It's a chain of concentration camps where people were killed by killing labor, by had, uh, <clears throat> because they had to perform the killing labor. Uh, where people were thrown for no reason. And he said, oh, we don't need this. We need this uh, good communist without this great terror. And Mao said, no, 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 you're not right. You have to be loyal to the cause of Comrade Stalin. So basically Mao declared the Soviet communists traitors. So you betrayed the cause of communism. So now I'm the leader. So I'm in charge of the communist camp. And uh, to this, the Soviet leaders said, including Khrushchev, who are you? to call the shots, so we, are, we were the first to bring communism, so you have no right to speak, you know, just, you have to imitate, you have to sing our song, you have to imitate us, and Mao said, no, no, I am right now taking the torch of Comrade Stalin, so hence this clash, two countries started to clash, which version of communism would be more reliable, okay, and in case of Mao, he was more extreme than Soviet communists, okay. This great leap forward ended in this disaster. In, by 1969, 30 million Chinese peasants died from starvation, more than in Soviet Russia. I repeat, 30, 30, 30 million peasants in China died from starvation because of these killing quotas Mao enforced on the Chinese countryside. Okay. And many within the Chinese Communist Party started to criticize Mao for his reckless experiments. So, like Stalin, he decided to declare the Great Terror, to eliminate his opponents, to purge him, either to exile them, to kill them, or to put them in prison. And um, he called it the Great Cultural Revolution. That's how Mao called this purge, the Great Purge of Communist Bureaucrats. Okay, So, he targeted old bureaucrats who criticize him or who could potentially criticize him he wanted to replace the entire communist bureaucracy to bring the new people who would be personally loyal to him okay and that was the campaign he uh, pursued in the 1960s so he purged old communist bureaucrats 
who were criticized for different kind of deeds, you know, false accusations, like in case of Soviet communist bureaucrats who had equally been blamed in the 1930s, uh, in 1930s for committing something they hadn't do, they hadn't done. So same thing in China, under the Cultural Revolution, communist bureaucrats or highly positioned um, people were blamed in something they hadn't done. Okay. What sustained, what sustained communism in Soviet Union and um, uh, China? Rich natural resources. See, in, uh, in case of Eastern European countries, which were imposed communists from the Soviet Union, they were subsidized by the Soviet Union. Since they were occupied by the Soviet Union, Soviet Union provided them resources. In case of China, China is a huge country, had all kinds of resources. So by exploiting natural resources, selling grain, remember under Stalin they sold grain, in China they sold rice, and in the late Soviet Union, they didn't have enough grain because they wanted to provide good food to uh, the Soviet people because to keep up with this welfare, okay, because they challenged China, remember, Soviets said, oh, we need to have a good welfare. So they had to subsidize food prices to give more bread, more food to the Soviet people, unlike the Chinese who were doing the Stalinist stuff. So that is why Soviets could not sell grain anymore. In fact, Soviets had to buy grain in 1960s, 1970s to keep up, to keep the people satisfied, you know, to show off that they are better than the Chinese, to provide welfare, um, good, cheap food to everybody. So uh, the grain was not sold anymore. In fact, Soviets had to buy grain from the United States, from Canada, to have enough uh, food for the entire population. What Soviets started to sell in the 1970s, 1980s, it was oil, gas, and gold. That's how the Soviet, communism in Soviet Union was able to sustain itself. But in China, and, uh, Mao Zedong kept everybody poor, uh, selling rice abroad and all kinds of natural resources, whatever they had, all kinds of metals, copper, um, gold also, whatever they had to offer. Okay? In, in, um, in this case, they were able to build the industry and to um, compete with, West, with Western countries. Okay? But unfortunately, in case of the Soviet Union in the 1980s, oil and gas prices went down. So that's what prompted the collapse of the Soviet Union and um, her satellites. Because communist economies in the Soviet Union, Eastern European countries, were very inefficient anyway. But they were able to keep up themselves, keep afloat by selling oil and gas. Okay? But now this source of revenue was gone. And immediately it was clear that these countries were not able to sustain themselves. They started to go down, okay? They started to go down. And um, what else contributed to the decline of the Soviet Union? Because Soviet Union was the major communist country, okay? It was the arms race, arms race. Soviet Union, to keep up with their United States, had to spend up to 40% of its budget to fund the military in contrast to the United States, which only had to spend 9% of it, of her budget, okay? Plus the support for the Third World allies drained the Soviet resources, okay? Essentially the Soviet Union, but in other communist countries, including China, lost to the United States and to the other Western countries in economic competition. Remember Khrushchev wanted to beat, to beat uh, the United States Economically, unfortunately, to Khrushchev and people like him who truly believers, who believed in socialism, life showed that uh, socialist system was not sustainable. It could not survive for a long time. Okay, And um, in China, by the way, they realized this in 1978 after Mao, the Chinese dictator, died. So the country was so devastated. The country was in ruins. And that is why the Chinese communist leadership decided to reform country somehow, a little bit at least. So that is why they abandoned collectivization of agriculture in China. In China, in fact, they were the first to give a little bit of freedom to peasants to work on land, okay, to work for themselves and to sell the produce for free. I think the reason they did it because 
the situation in China was so desperate, they had to do something. In Soviet Union, they maintained collective farms until the very end of the Soviet Union, until 1991, okay? <clears throat> in uh, 1985, a new young leader named Mikhail Gorbachev comes to power in the Soviet Union, who also wanted to do something, like in China, where they had reformed their agriculture in 1978, okay? So in Gorbachev in the Soviet Union said, I'm going to build socialism with a human face. So it means we are going to do reforms. What kind of reforms? See, unlike the Chinese communists who still maintain the dictatorial power of the Communist Party and the secret police, in fact, to the present day, China is still formerly a communist country, which is ruled by the Communist, uh, communist Party, which is um, uh, policed by the secret police. It's a communist dictatorship still. Although uh, in, econ in economy they practice capitalism, it's like a capitalist economy in China controlled by communist government. But in the Soviet Union, Gorbachev decided to reform political system, which is unusual. He said, we need to destroy Stalinist model completely. We need to open the country uh, to, for criticism. We need to introduce many parties. We need to start perestroika, which means restructuring. Uh, but he put emphasis on uh, lifting censorship, on uh, openness, okay, on legalization of political parties. And uh, he went even further. In 1990, he uh, rewrote the Soviet constitution where it was now said that the Communist Party was not the ruling force in the Soviet Union. So basically, he allowed the multi-party system. He invited... Uh, which is un was unusual in the Soviet Union, he invited people for free elections, okay? In 1990, the Soviet Union had free elections. <clears throat> he thought, he naively believed that by doing this, he would um, strengthen communist system, but in reality, opposite happened. So when he pulled out these bricks from the building of the communist dictatorship, the whole dictatorship started falling apart. See, in China, they knew better. They, cha they changed the economy, but they never changed the political system. To the present day, as I said, it's still a communist country. But in the Soviet Union, they changed the political system. And at first, by the way, they didn't do too many changes in the economy, so totally opposite. And when political system was changed rapidly, so we, this opened the gates to the destruction of the entire socialist system. And by 1991, Soviet Union was gone. It collapsed. Okay. Instead of strengthening communism, Gorbachev destroyed communism because he tried to reform the political system and he didn't realize, he didn't understand that you could not reform the communist uh, or socialist country for that matter. Neither socialist nor communist country. As soon as you began reforming it, it would fall apart, like any other dictatorship, okay? So that's what happened with the Soviet Union. I like to show my students this cartoon. It's my favorite cartoon. Um, it, it is to uh, give you an idea what actually Gorbachev did, you know? He wanted to build the socialism with a human face. That was his goal. He thought he would polish the image of Soviet communism and would build something that would be socialism, so this reformed communism, so more soft version socialism with democratic socialism, democratic socialism. But in the process of building this democratic socialism, he completely destroyed uh, the, the country. So hence this uh, cartoon where this hammer and sickle breaking apart. So I, he kind of shown here by saying, oh, I didn't mean it, I didn't know what happened, but that's exactly what happened. So it's essentially people uh, felt the sense of freedom and they started to criticize more and more. They felt they were given leeway and from criticism of Stalin, they turned to criticism of Lenin, Marx, Engels, all these founding fathers of communism and socialism. And eventually they started to criticize Gorbachev and the entire socialist system was now criticized. So it was like an, um, a Pandora's box, avalanche of criticism. And soon Gorbachev was buried under the rubbles of this collapsing building of communism. Okay. So 1991, the Soviet Union naturally collapsed. He, uh, Gorbachev 
couldn't do anything. He just watched it. And eventually he had to admit, I lost my country. So he became the president of the country that didn't exist. In fact, Soviet Union split in 15 countries before there were 15 nationalities uh, or so-called th republics, 15 republics within the Soviet Union. Now, after 1991, these republics became independent countries like Ukraine, Moldova, Georgia, Armenia, Lithuania, Latvia, Estonia, you name them. In Central Asia, Kazakhstan, see all these independent countries emerged in 1991, okay, in the wake of the uh, Soviet Union collapse. Oh, here, by, it's, a, it's a better map. So see, here you can see all these 15 independent countries which emerged at the place where the Soviet Union had existed. And of course, satellite countries in Eastern Europe also wanted freedom. And Gorbachev said, ah, hell with you, do whatever you want. I'm not going, I don't have resources and a desire to subjugate you. So basically he let them go, which immediately was interpreted by these people as invitation to revolt against communism and quickly communist dictatorships in these satellite countries collapsed collapsed in poland in fact in 1989 there were free elections where independent labor union anti-communist labor union came to power okay in czechoslovakia in hungary communist party system simply disbanded itself on its own which shows that how these socialist regimes were unpopular, that they were imposed by the Soviets. So they didn't never enjoy the popular support. In Eastern Germany, hundreds of thousands of people went to the streets and they um, chanted, chanted, Gorby, 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 Gorby. It's a nickname in the West um, uh, for Gorbachev. Okay. Secret police in Eastern Germany couldn't do anything because it was human tide. And in November of 1989, this crowd of uh, Germans from East Berlin pushed, uh, broke the Berlin Wall, crashed, smashed Berlin Wall and became reunited with the sisters and brothers in West Berlin. So Germany became again a reunited country, a reunited country, 1990. Okay. Um, China was in fear, the Chinese communist leadership which had introduced some reforms, I, re I repeat, in agriculture, they had introduced market, they had give, uh, given in some incentive to peasants, they uh, uh, abolished collective farms, communes, and they had given um, Chinese peasants incentive to work on their small uh, personal land plots, although land was not privatized in China, but still peasants were allowed to cultivate their land, uh, land strips, and sell the produce freely on the market okay but in terms of political power it was still a communist country in terms of elections no free elections in terms of freedom of press there was no freedom of press in china and now china was challenged by their gorbachev reforms in the soviet union okay so within the china there was a large group of people who said hey we want to do the same like in the soviet union let's introduce the multi-party system let's have freedom of speech like they're in soviet union that like they have in soviet union where they criticize stalin lenin whatever okay some students even uh, in china went even further they started to demonstrate in beijing the capital of china carrying the effigy this um, made of um, uh, Papier Maché, the Statue of Liberty, this uh, Statue of Lady Liberty, carrying it um, uh, through the central streets of Beijing, uh, telling uh, the surrounding people that we need democracy, we need free elections. Okay, so look at what was going on in the Soviet Union. So now look at the United States. So we need freedom. And there was a split within the Chinese leadership. One group of... Uh, Chinese bureaucrats said, we need to open the country like they had done in the Soviet Union. But another more powerful faction of the Communist Party in China said, are you kidding? Are you crazy? So they will destroy us. They will destroy us. And what especially, um, what especially petrified, what, uh, I don't have it here, what especially petrified the Chinese leadership was Romania. 
I forgot to mention that Romania was the only Eastern European country where a communist, uh, you know, some communist bureaucrats and a secret police tried to resist the popular revolt. In Romania, there was a dictator named Nicolae Ceausescu, who was an independent communist dictator, who did not depend on China, did not depend on the Soviet Union. So in his country, people also went to the streets, they demonstrated against him. But he ordered secret police to shoot at the demonstrators. So there were fights for two days. There were street fights um, on the streets of Bucharest. It's a capital of Romania. And eventually, the uh, army went to join uh, people, resisted helping people to resist against the secret police. And the dictator was overrun. And in fact, this dictator, Romanian dictator, was caught and was executed along with his wife on the spot in Romania in 1989. He was executed right on the spot by angry people. And the footage of this execution was watched by the Chinese uh, uh, elite, communist elite, and they were petrified. They were afraid that something might this, like, something like this might happen with them. So uh, the strong faction, uh, hardliners in the Communist Party of China overwhelmed the other faction that said we need to liberalize the country. And this uh, hardline faction decided to send tanks tanks again against people who demonstrated on the streets of Beijing. Ironically, Gorbachev came to visit China in summer of uh, <clears throat> in May of 1989. And in fact, uh, when he was visiting China, uh, more and more students, more and more workers streamed to the streets uh, chanting Gorby, 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 Gorby. We want to do the same like in the Soviet Union, <laughs> opening, uh, we need to open the country, we need to democratize the country, many parties, free elections, all these things. And again, Chinese um, leaders waited for Gorbe, Gorbachev to go back home. And as soon as he uh, went back home in summer of 1989, they sent tanks against thousands of students who literally pitched a camp. Uh, on the square of Tiananmen. Tiananmen, it's a central square in Beijing. In Beijing, okay. And these tanks crash the students, crash students, kill students. Thousands of students were killed. It was literally carnage, bloody carnage. There was blood on tanks, blood on asphalt everywhere. It was a brutal, a brutal carnage. People were executed. To the present day, it's forbidden. It's forbidden even to talk about this massacre. It's called Tian Tiananmen Massacre. If you, if you ask Chinese students here in, uh, I don't know if we have still some Chinese students. If you ask some Chinese students about this, ask them about Tiananmen Square Massacre. They will be petrified to talk about it, especially in the presence of the other Chinese, because they might be afraid that, or they might report me to the government. So it's forbidden in China to talk about this massacre. This famous picture I'm going to show you here uh, shows you uh, in 1989, in some of 1989, it um, spread all over the Western world in many Western media outlets. This picture was produced and reproduced. So it shows the uh, Chinese tanks with the person who somehow by accident turned out to stand, nobody knows who he is, you know, but he turned out to cross the street, crossing the street in front of the tank. If you uh, look closely at his image, you will see that in his left hand, he carries a shopping bag. It's a very revealing image of a person in a communist country. In many communist countries uh, before, socialism uh, collapsed people uh, each day went outside with uh, uh, purchasing bags why just in case in case they were able to buy something it didn't matter what they could buy something because merchandise was hardly available in regular stores except in food stores some basic food items so whatever uh, by accident they could purchase in government stores they tried to get there were long lines so uh, it was the uh, constant image of a shopper, a person with a shopping bag. So basically you see a person 
a small little guy standing with a purchasing bag in front of tanks it kind of, it's a very symbolic for me basically it's um it's a very meaningful image it tells us that i just want to buy the stuff i just want to be secure i don't want to be told what to do and i i would just want to have a little bit of something i just want to freely go shopping i don't want government to shut down stores i don't want government to uh, order me what to do i don't want me to be on welfare i simply want to be free to do my own star and here he sees the tanks that do not allow him to do this. It's a very powerful image, okay? A little guy and a huge military machine of the socialist state, okay? So uh, in China, I repeat, these reforms, of course, didn't go anywhere. And I repeat, political reforms never happened to the present day. It's a communist country, brutal communist country. But... In the economy, they do have capitalism. It's a capitalism controlled by the government. Okay, so that's what China is right now. It's a, it's a, uh, state capitalism controlled by the communist government. It's a literally like a pyramid. Imagine a pyramid. So when I teach this class in the classroom, I usually draw a pyramid on a chalkboard and I divide this pyramid in two parts. And the top part of this pyramid, I write, commanding heights controlled by communists. Okay, that's the political system. Communist party, secret police, okay, all court system, army, everything is controlled uh, by the communist party. And the bottom of the pyramid, I write, state capitalism. It means market, limited market controlled by the communist state. So that's what this strange mixture. And... Of course, it might work for a while, but eventually it doesn't work. It does give people a little bit of freedom in the economy. You know, people are allowed, you know, to own restaurants or coffee places, uh, private restaurants, small companies, not big companies. Airlines, banks, the major industries are still controlled by the government. It's not for sale, unlike the United States and other Western countries where... We have phenomenon of Bill Gates, whatever, uh, Zuckerberg. So such things are impossible. Whatever names you hear, like Alibaba, Huawei, uh, when you uh, see the references in the media, or CEO or Alibaba, CEO or Huawei, okay? It doesn't make any sense because the heads of these companies are planted there by the communist government. These are the state-controlled companies. So China is still a communist country. Okay. So anyway, but all in all, in other countries, uh, socialism was down. Socialism was gone. Eastern Europe, Soviet Union. Okay. And partially in China. Even in China, you see that communism was partially gone. What does it tell us? It tells us a lot. It tells us that by 1980s, it was clear all over the world that socialism did not work. That is why we have many countries silently, normally silently, without saying anything, dropping communism or socialism. India silently abandoned socialism, democratic socialism, 1991. So state-owned factories were privatized. Indian currency was now freely exchanged. Uh, welfare was curtailed. Tanzania in Africa dropped African socialism silently, peacefully. In fact... The um, Tanzanian dictator, socialist dictator, his name is Julius Nyerere, uh, found the guts to say, guys, I am wrong. Socialism did not work. So let's just give people freedom. So it's a very rare. I never actually accept Gorbachev, although even Gorbachev didn't say it openly. Gorbachev wanted to reform socialism. But in case of Tanzania, we have a unique example of a dictator who came up to the public and himself admitted that socialism did not work. So we are going to abandon this, okay? Egypt kicked out Soviet military advisors and dropped any talks uh, about socialism. Nicaragua had free elections, abandoned socialism. Vietnam 
the former opponent of the United States, which was fighting to save communism against the United States. Remember, 1960s, there was a brutal war between the U.S. and Vietnam. The Soviets supported Vietnam in, against the United States. And Vietnam actually won this war in 1975, and communism won in Vietnam. But eventually, Vietnamese communist leadership in 1990s realized that socialism did not work. So they slowly, slowly, slowly started to liberalize communism, turning it to democratic socialism, and then introduce state capitalism. And right now, Communist Party um, doesn't control the country. So it's a, it's a relatively open country, which had, state is still powerful in Vietnam. A formerly Communist Party does control the country, but not as brutal as in China, for instance. Okay, So they too have, they too have state capitalism right now. Okay, and that's where, I, where I'm going to end. Okay, I'm going to end here. And please um, visit eCourseWare for any updates. And I will see you next time. Thank you so much for your attention.